All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming along to my little talk this afternoon. I know it's Sunday afternoon, last talk of the conference, and people are, are fading a little bit. Um, fortunately, this is not a deep dive, so you don't have to think too hard. Um, my name is Hamish. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to be at the con um, this weekend of um, a good friend's wedding on. Um, but it is my honor to come along and talk today. Um, I am a recovering engineer, now product manager at Coordinates. Who's heard of Coordinates? Yay. Um, we do geospatial stuff um, primarily, and we've got a web app, um, which hopefully some people have used. Um, <coughs> a lot of Python um, and Django is kind of our deal. Um, so I'm going to talk about flags. Um, a bit of a backstory into, into um, a little project that I'm going to talk about is um, uh, sort of had its genesis at Gather um, conference in 2015, which is a cool sort of unconference that ran for several years, which sadly is um, no longer in existence. Um, back then, um, we had this uh, flag referendum going. There was lots of uh, talk about all this flag design stuff. And there were people doing talks about flag design. And it was really interesting. And I thought that was cool. And um, everyone was sort of submitting their um, homemade flag designs, like Lazy Kiwi and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm no vexillologist, um, but I have Python. So I thought it would be fun to have a look at whether it would be possible to actually generate a flag. Um, and so I did. I came up with this thing um, called that would basically take a genome and it would generate a flag design. Um, and this is an example. This is one of my favorite ones that came out of it. It was like the first part is a, is a color palette, and the second part is some um, is the actual designs that go on there. So we've got a um, <coughs> we've got an English cross with a um, I forget what it's called diagonal cross on top of it with another cross on top of it, and that's all encoded in that um, URL, or um, well, in that sort of bit of text rather. Um, and that's pretty neat. And you could basically generate all these random things and it would generate these flag designs. Um, I'm going to try and actually do it um, in front of you, which is um, always risky. Um, so, um, is that super tiny? No, no one can see that. Uh, okay. Um, so basically, you go like um, f equals flag dot parse, create random genome, flag dot show. That's a randomly generated flag. Um, let's go another one. Hey, that's the same. Yeah, because I didn't actually call it. Stunning, which is, you know, honestly, half better than half the uh, submissions that, that we have <laughs> ever done. Um, and I also made it that you could evolve the de design. So we, if we have a look at that one again, um, it's pretty crazy. Um, but I've got sort of f2 equals f dot evolve, f2 dot show. Hmm, that wasn't very dramatic. Okay, so the idea was that it would. You know, you could take a design and you could evolve it and you could create a new design. And I had big ambitions of, um, of playing with a genetic algorithm, algorithm that would then, um, you know, try and fit it to some sort of um, objective um, measure of what a good flag was. And of course, that was impossibly difficult. Um, so I sort of forgot about it. Um, and then a friend of mine who was running um, a arts festival said, "Hey, would you like to do something um, again? I'm no designer, I'm not an artist, but I can do these flag things." So um, I thought, hey, it'd be really fun to um, make something that was online and interactive. And they thought that was really cool because they had lots of um, artists making really crazy things, but um, not a lot of sort of digital stuff. <coughs> and um, so I said that I would um, uh, put something together. And so I thought I'd put um, that thing online. Um, and it being 2015 and kind of, you know, we get a bit stuck in our tools sometimes. Um, we'd been using AWS a lot, and I, I sort of wanted to learn a bit about it, and sort of EC2 was kind of the, the way to put something online. So I was like, okay, Flag and Postgres, you know, that'd be dead simple. Um, now I just need an EC2 instance, and it's going to have to have Nginx running Gunnicorn to run a Flask app that is behind a CloudFront um, thingy. And then um, 
uh, RDS, which is you know the Postgres-like um, AWS server, um, and that was pretty cool. It was a bit of a pain to actually set that up. I probably, I probably spent more time configuring all that than I did in building the original kind of flag generating thing. Um, but it all worked, you know. And um, you know um, the AWS, they give you, you know, um, a bunch of free credits, so I could run this thing for next to free. Um, and it looked like, hey, get me out. That was random. Um, hmm. Of course, I didn't actually test this bit of it. Uh, app, server, Python. Application. Uh. Okay. Uh, running on there, so I can grab that, and I can go to there, and I can go to that. Um, and here we go. So now it's running in um, a Flask app, and it's generating random designs. Um, and it would save the flags into a database, and people could then click the button and evolve the design more, and then you could favorite the gallery, and, um, and that was all pretty cool. Um, so I was pretty, proud, pretty pleased with myself with that. But it was still running in um, EC2 and RDS, and of course I kind of forgot about it, and then your free credits run out, and then you got a bill for 60 US dollars a month, um, which I hear is a common story with these things. It's kind of how they suck you in, I guess. Um, but that's kind of expensive to actually do that. It's just, it's just sitting there. It's, it's almost never being used. Um, and it's just spinning um, in the cloud um, and wasting your money. So um, this year, the same friend was organizing another art festival and said, you know, could we um, do that again? And I thought, yeah, that'd be cool. I can add some new things. I'm going to make it animated. It's going to have um, stars and circles, not starts and circles. Um, but I don't really want to do it on EC2 again, so I had a look at if there was another way. And basically, because what I really need is somewhere to host some static content um, and some way to generate these flags on demand, um, I didn't actually need all that stuff that was running all the time, and people were talking a lot about serverless stuff, so I thought, hey, maybe that is an ideal way to start learning about it. So what are the pieces that we can use to do with this? Um, the first one is Lambda, right? Who, who's actually heard of AWS Lambda? Okay, lots of people. So AWS Lambda basically um, lets you um, plug in a bunch of code and something will happen and it will return some sort of result, which sounds kind of trivial, but the fact is it's running in AWS's infrastructure. You can call it a million times and it will just happen uh, kind of magically. Um, it also can be triggered by a whole bunch of stuff so you can trigger it on an API request. You can trigger it on all sorts of events that happen in S3, uh, all sorts of ha events that happen in AWS. Um, so you kind of look at the list of triggers, and it's kind of daunting the number of things that you could sort of plug in from one end of it. And then, uh, and then um, it's got full access to the internet, um, but it's also got access to all your internal resources. It's got things like Bodo sort of um, built in as well. So you've got all the power of, um, of that particular library to talk to or your AWS stuff. Um, you, the pricing's interesting. You pay per megabyte memory per second of execution time, and you kind of got to say how much memory your thing's going to use. So at the lowest tier, it's 128 megabytes of memory, um, and you're paying for each second in 100 millisecond intervals. But the pricing's insane. It's um, at that tier, 3.2 million free seconds, which I think is more than a month of just execution time, um, free. And then beyond that, it's 0 0.000000, some number of zeros, um, 2 8 per 100 milliseconds. Um, so it's very cheap to actually do kind of all the trivial API stuff that, that I'm kind of trying to do um, is essentially free because if I actually manage to hit 3 million um, seconds of uptime, then I've become sort of insanely famous artist um, and you know, paying the subsequent bill of um, infinitely small number of cents per millisecond, um, it would just be irrelevant. Um, so let's, um, I can actually try and do that. 
So I'm in ABDS Lambda. <coughs> this is what it looks like. Um, um, so that's the console. Um, you basically just go create function. We can author from scratch. Um, we can, well, it supports a whole bunch of runtimes, but hey, 3.6. Not that one, this one. Um, you have to give it a role. Uh, which is, gives you basic execution, which is cool. Test function for fun. Right, and it creates this lambda function. Um, you can add a trigger, so you can say how it is actually um, executed. But just for now, we can actually go and like create our function. We've got like this code editor thing here, which is kind of crazy. Um, so we can just sort of Save that. You can test it. You can give it all sorts of test data as well. So you can set up sort of like, I guess it's a bit like a unit test for your, for your actual lambdas. Um, I think it's supposed to give us some. And actually run the test, we can see the result, we can see how much uh, uh, memory was used, we can see the build duration, all that kind of um, handy stuff. It seems a bit kind of, you know, 1995. I'm, I'm editing code in a little thing online. It's a bit like uploading zip files to like FTP servers or something at, at this kind of level. Um, but the fact is, I've just created a function that runs um, in ABS, so that was super easy. Um, if you are doing things more complex, then you can um, build your virtual environment, and then you can just basically upload the whole thing. Um, it's got a whole bunch of stuff um, available already, like Bodo I mentioned before, and requests. Um, but anything else you want to add, you can, um, you can package in. And there's also a bunch of really handy, um, there's a GitHub uh, uh, repo you should look up. I think it's called Lambda Functions. It's basically a whole bunch of pre-built stuff that you can bring into your project and, uh, and upload it um, as well. So we've got a Lambda function, right? And now we need to have some way to talk to it over the internet. Um, and so I can't remember when Lambda first came out. It was, it was a little bit limited. It, it, was, it had a bunch of functions, but didn't have a lot of ways to actually in, interface with the functions. And then API Gateway came along. API Gateway gives you a whole way of setting up um, endpoints that are publicly accessible, um, which let you talk to um, not only Lambda, but a whole bunch of other services um, that are available too. Um, but it's cool though, because you can set up different resources, um, different models within um, API Gateway. Um, authorizers, so if you want people to be forced to use their sort of two-factor authenticated AWS account to talk to the API request, you can set it up. If you want it to be publicly available um, to anyone and anyone, um, then you can. Different methods. Um, you can set up different deployments. It's got monitoring baked into CloudWatch too, so you can see everything that's happening um, within AWS's own monitoring infrastructure. Even beyond that, like it's got all the business logic that you, that you kind of want um, around a lot of these things as well. So you can create usage plans, you can generate API keys, you can set rate limits. So you can have a, you can have a particular set of uh, API keys around a usage plan that have very low rate limits, then you can have a different set of API keys which have uh, much higher rate limits, for example. What's really cool is you can generate documentation from your API or you can import um, APIs defined in Swagger, for example. Um, and again, the pricing's um, pretty cheap, $3.5 per million, that's US dollars per million API requests. Um, I should um, expand on that as well um, with API Gateway and Lambda, it's per request and then the sort of transfer fees as well. Um, so, you know, if you're pushing data in and out of um, S3, then you're gonna pay those transfer costs. Um, Usually, if things are sort of in the same data center or same region, um, you know, a lot of stuff is free as well. So that's pretty cool. So if we go back to um, our AWS console, then we can actually create an API that talks to that um, Lambda that we created. So I can go create API, test API. So you can see import from Swagger, um, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, we can create a uh, different kinds of methods and resources. So here we can create a get method. <coughs> so at the root of our API, there's a single get uh, method that we can do. It's going to call a lambda function, and we are in AP Southeast 2, which is a fancy name for Sydney. Um, you just plug in the name of your function, which was test function for fun. Save. Okay. It kind of adds the, um, the necessary role permissions as well along the way. And here we can kind of see a bit more of the detail of what's going on. Um, when a request comes in, um, it is then forwarded to the Lambda function. Um, it is processed. The result is then passed out again. And along, along the way, you can do things like transforming requests and adding headers and, and adding other tests along the way. So there's an awful lot of power there that, um, that I've only really had a little sort of play with. Um, but fundamentally, there's all the usual kind of things you might want to do with an API. You can set up, um, so here we've talked about um, gateway responses, right? So if you want to set up all your um, you know, 500 pages and 400 pages, and you can do that all here. You can set up your authorizers, different stages. So at the moment, we've got an API that is going to call our, um, call our single Lambda function and return something. Uh, at this point, we need to deploy the API. Um, so we're going to deploy it to a new stage, which we will call test. And if we open that, hello world. <clears throat> so I've just created an API. Like, it was that easy. Um, it's a trivial API for sure. But you can think of how, you know, any little, like, you know, you get an idea for a Slack bot that you want to create. And then, like, ah, oh, but then I need to have a thing that runs, you know, a, a, a bot server that is going to, like, handle the incoming webhooks and all that kind of stuff. Well, now you can, you can probably do this all in the console, just typing things in, hacking around um, in a couple of hours just for fun. And that's really cool. I really like the way that you can now, you know, have a little idea. You can, you can spin it up and, and test it out almost trivially. Um, and the cool thing about this as well, so you've got a whole bunch of, um, you can now start adding different types of stages. So you can have like a development stage and your production stage and you can switch, um, you can deploy different things. And um, um, yeah, it's neat. Um, so we talked about usage plans. So you've got things like usage plans that you can create for different APIs, throttling burst rates as well. So, you know, if your infrastructure, you know, this thing scales more as infinitely, right? So um, if your infrastructure that your API request is going to call um, is going to be destroyed by um, a sudden influx of a thousand requests, then you can make sure that doesn't happen as well. Um, quotas, all that kind of stuff. You can also throw them by custom domains as well. So um, by default that uh, if we have a look at this stage. So that's a, pretty, um, that's a pretty crazy URL, but you can put your own custom domains in front of that as well pretty easily, which is neat. Any questions so far? No? Yes. Hey, Richard. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, what do you do when you want to save state? Um, yeah, you're going to have to connect to a database or, you know, any other, you know, the appropriate service for that. Um, yeah, RDS is the, is the Postgres um, black one. Um, so um, you can connect to that or, um, so like in the, and then I'll talk about how I did it, what I did for, um, for the flags one in a second. Um, but yeah, that, that's true, right? Like, all you're getting is compute time. That's all you get. Um, but you've got effectively, infinitely scalable, incredibly cheap compute time. Um, so, I guess the other thing about lambdas is um, when you actually configure them, you are, go back to lambda. So 
So you have to say how long you think it's going to run. So you have to give it a maximum timeout, and that maxes out at three minutes. So that's a three minutes or five minutes, one of those. Timeout. Um, three or five minutes, I can't remember which. Um, and you've got to say how much memory you expect it to run. Um, if you hit the memory cap, then it's going to get um, um, killed. If you have the timeout, it's going to get killed. Um, so that's where things get a little bit different from running um, you know, your own stuff in EC2 um, machines, for example. Um, so of course, the last piece of this particular puzzle is S3. Um, in case you're not aware, S3 is Amazon's simple um, storage service. Um, big database of objects um, where you pay for what you store and access and it's very cheap. Um, but the other thing that some people might not be aware of is you can also use it as a static web host. <clears throat> so if you give your bucket name like example.com, call it uh, example.com, and then you point your example.com domain um, at the S3 path, then it will just become, it'll just start serving content as if it was a static web host. Um, which um, is a really cool feature, but it also interesting dots into bucket names causes other people all sorts of pain if you've ever had to like talk to uh, buckets via the API before. Um, so Foflags 2017 uses all of those things. And um, you can go visit it. It's at foflags.nz. Um, so basically what you're looking at is a really cool animated thing. Um, and it is um, hitting an API, which will then generate the random genomes and send you back um, the image. Uh, sorry, it's generating the flag, it's saving it to S3, <clears throat> and then it's redirecting you to the S3, um, or returning the S3 um, URL so you can then display it. Um, you'll see it's got, oh, yeah, cool. Um, it's got stars and circles. Didn't work out that great in the end, but I kept them in. Um, and in this case, what, what it's doing is it's kind of, it's taking the genomes and evolving it, giving it new images. And so this has been running for a while now. Um, it's had a little bit of use, I guess. I'm storing um, maybe 10,000 different flags. The whole thing's costing me like 20 cents a month. Um, you know, so, so that's pretty cool. That's really handy. Um, now, the way that I actually got that um, on there, Zapper. Um, so, um, Someone was, I think someone mentioned it at a lightning talk, I was told. Um, so you would have seen before, I was in the AWS console and I was sort of typing in code and then manually setting things up. Um, if you've ever used AWS um, uh, in anger, you'll know that um, everything is behind an API. You can manage everything about AWS via an API, which is, um, which is awesome. It means that you can do all that kind of stuff that I was doing point, point and clicky, you can do via APIs. And, there's a whole bunch of uh, frameworks out there now that are built around creating the kind of apps that I was talking about and, and, and letting you build your application like you would build any other, but then you push it to the appropriate serverless um, services to actually execute it. Um, I haven't looked at many of them. I've only really looked at Zapper, and even then, not in a lot of depth. And the reason I looked at Zapper was because um, it's kind, it seems to be very... Um, geared towards Flask and Django deployments, um, which you know I was using Flask, and so that seemed to make sense. But it's cool. It, it will build and package um, your project. It'll deploy it. Um, it'll deploy it into a Lambda function and to an API gateway. Configures everything for you, and then it gives you a handy CLI for actually deploying and rolling back. So if I go back to here, we'll just close that one, and we'll go. Um, so at the moment, I've got this hooked up to, so this is the Zappa um, instance for FireFlags.nz. Um, so I can do things like Zappa tail, and that will basically talk to CloudWatch and get my logs and give me the most recent activity um, from the logs there. It's kind of like a really slow way of just tailing your logs normally. Um, so it's not ideal, but there's a whole bunch of command line options for filtering and, and that kind of stuff. Um, it's also slow. There we go. So you can see all the stuff that you know you would normally see in, um, well, 
you can filter your different log types. You're going to get a lot of sort of internal cloud um, sort of lambda execution kind of noise in there as well. So you want to filter it down to the things you're actually interested in. Um, you know, you can do um, Zapper deploy to initially get your stuff out. Zapper upgrade and your stage. So update dev. So Zapper update dev. Um, so if you make changes, you know, it will then find all the changes, repackage them up, deploy it out, um, and just make it available. Um, so Zap is really cool. Um, it's, I don't do that on my mobile connection, actually. Um, yeah, so you can, like, deploy a particular stage. You can update a stage. Um, you can, you know, oh, shit, roll it back um, to previous stages. Um, tell your logs. Um, it's also got some handy um, extra features, so scheduling. So you can set up basically <coughs> scheduled Lambda functions really easily with Zapper, which is cool. Um, so you think about all the things you might use Celery for, for example. Um, you could look at whether you want to actually use that for um, in um, Lambda functions instead. You know, you might have a whole machine, right, dedicated just to running, um, running Celery workers. Um, do you actually need that spinning all the time. <clears throat> also, I mean, some of the stuff we do, um, it is bursty. You know, you might get a whole bunch of requests which um, feeds a bunch of s events into Celery. Um, and we've had issues in the past where, you know, a large spike in activity can actually um, lead to real big problems in Celery queues. Um, we just wouldn't have that problem with Lambda. Um, of course, unscheduled. Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, some downsides with Zappa in particular, and I, I, I'm pretty sure this is, just from what I've had a look around, this is, seems to be reasonably common. Um, ease of use is awesome, um, but you're, you're really papering over a lot of the complexity, and I feel like what you want to do is understand the complexity in a little bit of detail first before relying on one of these frameworks. Um, particularly right to the last point, um, the defa default, role, default IAM roles that, you, that it sort of asks you to set up are really liberal. Um, and it's so easy with AWS to slowly creep your policy to the point where, you know, you've got some Lambda function role over here that turns out has global read access to S3 over here, and that credential leaks and, you know, everything falls over. Um, so I feel like um, there is some danger there and not necessarily understanding how AWS kind of works, um, how IAM works, all those kind of things. IAM is the... Um, user management kind of portion. Um, with Zappa, it kind of cheats. So instead of setting up all the different routes as API endpoints with an API gateway and then a whole bunch of Lambda functions that might handle the different Flask methods <coughs> that you've set up, um, it kind of just packages the whole Flask app into a single method, into a single Lambda function, rather. And it gives you a single um, API gateway uh, endpoint and just kind of lets them, um, lets those components, well, particularly the Lambda function, kind of handle everything. So I kind of feel it's cheating a little way. So if we have a look again at, um, you know, here's my, here's all my Lambda functions. I've got one Lambda function for that Five Flags app, even though there's sort of five or six different endpoints under the hood. And uh, in API Gateway, um, again, there's sort of five or six different endpoints that you might actually hit, um, but what it has is just a single, this, this proxy thing, which basically takes every request and passes it after Flask. Um, so it's kind, of a, it's kind of cheating in a way, but it works, and it's really great for hacking things together quickly. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll talk really quickly. I think we've got 10 minutes left. Is that right? Um, um, so that was kind of a fun project, right? But um, one really serious use case that at coordinates we used um, Lambda in particular for recently was um, a migration project we had going on this year. So coordinates, um, you know, we had three kind of on-premise, um, sorry, three instances of our, of our whole stack. Um, we had two local kind of um, on-premise type installations, and then we had our own version running on um, AWS. And we had to merge the three into one. Um, and we had shared identifiers between all three projects. We needed to be able to uh, merge everything while it was running. 
So there was essentially going to be um, minimal downtime. We're talking about like, you know, an evening of downtime. Um, and we, the particular thing that I was looking at was the analytics system that we had. Um, we had six years of analytics history. Um, right now we pump in five, uh, 50 million events a month. Um, all the shared identifiers in that history had to be rewritten to kind of to merge all our, um, our history into the single project. And it had to happen with no downtime. So one thing that um, I find this kind of good, um, good for is those kind of ETL kind of tasks, the extract, transform, and load kind of tasks. So in our case, we were using Keen.io. Does anyone use Keen.io for analytic stuff? Um, it's really cool for just um, for running kind of usage and kind of thing where you know you get like a million different events happen in your in your system, and you want to see you know how many of those events um, summed up by some dimension based on the user, and then you know. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a purpose-built database of event collection that lets you spit out analytics data very quickly. Um, so we had an enormous amount of history of that. And they have this handy feature where they can stream raw event data into S3 buckets for free, which is really neat. So you pump in all your event data, um, and every five minutes, they push it back out again into an S3 bucket. What's handy is that Lambda can be triggered by S3 puts and posts. So you can, you can trigger Lambdas on all sorts of different events in in AWS infrastructure. But S3 puts is a really interesting one. So basically, you can tell it to, um, anytime S3 sees a new object, run a Lambda function. And that Lambda function can do anything. So in this case, what, what we set it up to do was every time one of these um, buckets of data came in, um, extract the data, find all the identifiers, um, change the identifiers to what we know that they need to be now, um, do some other maintenance along the way as well. So we're like, oh, you know, these things were sort of originally designed sort of five years ago, and of course, all those people were idiots. Um, the same people still work here, but now we're a lot smarter, so we can fix some things we've always wanted to fix. And then we can push that data into a new Keen project. So what we had was three live running projects that were then streaming um, all of our analytics data into a new project, but now with non-conflicting identifiers. So that's pretty cool. Um, and what it meant was that come migration day, we could basically point whole project, we point the whole system with all the merged data at the new merged analytics system and things just keep working. You know, it's the same data, um, but all the identifiers in the database have changed, all the identifiers in the analytics system have changed. Users completely unaware that anything actually happened. Um, the other part of that was backfill. So, um, you know, we had half a billion historic events that we had to pull out of the existing projects and do the same transform and load process on. Um, so there's a couple of things we can do there. We can massively paralyze it via Lambda as well. Um, some of those things we can aggregate. So we're like, well, actually, well, let's have some special Lambda functions that um, will actually run queries on our analytic system um, and take you know, a day's worth of queries, which might be like a million events, and then spit out um, an aggregate of the dimensions we actually care about, and so you might get a 1,000 events on the other side. Um, to actually call that, we can then, we plugged an API gateway in front of it so that we can say, well, I want to migrate this bit of data over this time frame, hit a button, and it will asynchronously go and call it. So with the API gateway, you can do things synchronously or asynchronously. <clears throat> you can do, so the event, the example that we did just um, in the console before is like a synchronous one. It's calling the Lambda, it's returning the result of the Lambda. Um, you can also do asynchronous calls where it will immediately return, yeah, yeah, I've triggered the thing. Um, now it's up to you to actually make sure it actually happened. Uh, which is handy because, you know, we're doing things that might take, um, might take you know, half a minute, um, and we want to be able to um, run a whole bunch of them and uh, monitor their progress. Um, yeah, so we did it. We massively paralyzed it, and then um, we got an uh, email from concerned engineers <coughs> at uh, Keen saying, hey, that's great that you're uh, doing the migration, but um, you're damaging our infrastructure <laughs> because it turns out that um, actually running um, uh, thousands of these things at the same time is, um, is not being a good citizen. Um, Said this graph through of like, you know, the pink line is us. The other lines are sort of the more normal background activity that was going on at the same time. Um, so basically we backed it off and we said, okay, we can actually run this and it'll take a um, couple of weeks to actually process all our data, but we can do it backwards in time. And, and again, um, uh, no one's really the wiser that we've made this major transformation under the hood. 
So just last of all, um, just some gotcha learnings and thoughts from my sort of relatively limited experience with all this. Um, big gotcha. Async lambdas will sometimes fail for mysterious reasons. <clears throat> and they will be, the, the policy is they get retried twice and then discarded. Um, so you need to be able to, this, this is the kind of fun thing you find, you know, sort of 10,000 event, you know, 10,000 executions into your migration process. Oh, there's some extra data. Where did this data come from? Oh crap, I need to delete it all and start again. <clears throat> because what happened is it, it actually did the ETL process. And then I suspect what's happened is the system that actually checks that it's run correctly has fallen over. And then it goes, okay, I'm gonna try it again in 10 minutes. And it's 10 minutes as well, so you can't look at after five minutes. You're like, after five minutes, you're like, oh, it looks good. <coughs> but then you come back in a quarter of an hour and all your data's wrong. Sorry, my throat stick. Uh, so you can look at um, deleted queues for SQS and SNS for unexecuted things, but you do need to handle double execution properly. <coughs> Latency is a problem, so that four flags up, I think latency can be about a second sometimes. Um, you're not gonna get the same um, with that approach. Um, the ECT approach is gonna have better performance. There's a thing called Lambda at Edge now, um, which I think might help a lot. There might be a whole bunch of configuration you do to improve it. But generally it seems latency is not great. Of course, if you worry about lock-in, um, then you know if your business is built on this, then it's gonna be pretty hard to switch. That said, it is just Python functions um, talking to um, gateway routes. So a lot of these frameworks, are, you know, some of them are designed to be able to um, <clears throat> uh, cooperate with Azure and all that kind of stuff too. And last of all, um, if you're an API-only business, um, you want to be careful because your barriers to entry are really low. So you kind of see this with um, the likes of Keen.io and other sort of API-based um, companies where I think a lot of them are racing to the value add on top of it. Um, that, you know, because you can come in and just build your Slack bots or your analytics platform or, or whatever um, without having to deal with ops burden that you traditionally would have had to around the same sort of high volume services. <clears throat> All right, so that's me. Um, any questions? Sorry, just give me a second while I uh, try to my throat. For the um, production use of Lambda you're talking about, are you using Zappa to manage those, or? Sorry, sorry. For the for the ETL and the analytics thing, are you yep. using Zappa to manage those, or? Am I using what? Are you using Zappa to manage? Oh, those? Zappa, no, no. So, um, <clears throat> so no, that I, I we did that before. Uh, that came before the flags thing, um, and. Um, I guess also because it's a, a business use, a little less inclined to like use the thing that gives, you know, that has a lot of IAM, a permissive IAM role to do um, something that important. Um, that said, if I was gonna do it again, I would definitely look at actually um, a proper framework for doing it rather than, you know, you know, you build your like function and then you zip it up and then you upload it um, and then you test it and you, uh, you know, it's very, like I said, 95 where you're sort of, uploading things by FTP. It feels very similar. Um, I do think it's gonna be a little while before <clears throat> the very big list of frameworks is rationalized to the two or three really good ones. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, you, you do have limits, right? So, um, you know, you gotta look at that execute, it depends on the kind of data that you're capturing. Um, hmm? Yeah, I mean, you've... Yeah, I mean, this will give you the back end stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you need to talk to RDS or something similar, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, 
the uh, so the lambda function, uh, the uh, the API REST point that you're creating has um, has a funny URL. How do I make it pretty? <laughs> you can um, you can plug your own URLs in front of it too, so your own domains. Um, there's stuff in there for, for doing that. Um, and you can also put certificates in there too. So you can make it sort of SSL protected under your domain, relatively straightforward. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, we've okay. run out of time. Thank you, Hamish.